<laughs> so here we go. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it that you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. And Jesus said, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. And Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, we do thank you so very much for this Sunday morning in which we can gather here. Even as the snow falls outside, we recognize the gloriousness of your creative genius. We thank you that you have bestowed upon us the ability to express our own creativity that reflects our devotion upon you and our individuality for who you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you for life itself. And we pray even now as we encounter your word that the words of my mouth and the meditations upon our hearts would be made acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So I was doing some research and prep for this message, and digging around all over, you know, checking out different websites and seeing different articles that were printed and, and extracting these different stories and anecdotes, and I came across this one, which <laughs> really kind of, I can't believe it. You know, it gets into that classification of, you got to be kidding me. So this university president recounts a real story that a parent had called him because of a disagreement that, is hap that had happened between this parent's child and another student in the dorm room, all right? In the dormitory, there was a little of a, you know, it wasn't even fisticuffs. It was just a disagreement. And who knows what it was. It didn't say in the article what the disagreement was. It could be that there were clothes on the floor. I don't know. But in another planet or in another generation, this kind of thing would have been handled by the RA. And if the RA didn't quite get it right, it would go to the RD and probably stop there. But no, this parent even says in the article that the parent was clear and saying, I was going straight to the top. So it calls the president of the university to complain about this issue. <laughs> it gets better. There's this, there's this dean of students who recounts a story where this mother calls and asks what kind of laundry machines, washing machines, are available in the dormitory. Because her daughter had specialized running clothes that were extremely expensive and needed a certain type of laundering to be able to maintain the integrity of these running clothes. She's calling the dean of students about this. This is crazy town. I mean, <laughs> what is going on here when people think that this is legitimate stuff? You know, so, you know, uh, scholars are acknowledging the fact that the baby boomer parents, all right, which I'm part of that generation too, so they're just they're like baby boomers, I mean, they're just causing trouble all along from generation, you know, as, as, as decades progress. So the baby boomer parents are the ones that are, you know, kind of extracting this or imposing this upon their, their millennial children. And it's having this impact upon the people around. They are intervening in the in the, before others for the sake of their children. This 
intervention. Well, I think about that, and I go, hmm, well, okay. Well, is there anything wrong about intervening on behalf of your child? Well, really, no, not at all. You know, I, I think intervention is a, is a healthy thing to do. You know, here you are as a parent, and, and, and there's your two-year-old or three-year-old who's about to get into a circumstance that might not be safe or healthy for them, and you're going to intervene and protect them and save them, right? That's part of the nature of why we as parents do what we do. If there's a threat of life and limb, and we have the capacity to, to interject a, a, a net of safety, then we will do that, right? The reality is, is what is unfortunate <laughs> is that the, the level of intervention that we exercise becomes a little, how shall I say, egregious because it, it hasn't been coupled with the child development and the age of the child. Our intervention that we have and express at age three for a child should be different than the intervention that we express for a child that's 15, 16, 17, and even 20 years old. But what we see is that it doesn't change. And parents get involved a little too deeply in the lives of their children. You know, this is not something that is unique to our generation. You know, there's a scholar, his name was Haim Gotim, who came up with the term that I'm going to tell you, and many of you know, and here it is, a helicopter mom. He's the one who came up with this term in 1969. And he was writing about this. He was <clears throat> a professional educator, taught at elementary age, children, and then uh, came over to the United States and studied and got his PhD and became a child psychologist and wrote the seminal book that is still used to this day called Between Parent and Child. And I recommend it to you. Now he comes up with this term, helicopter parent, and, and parent.com and education.com, the two websites that I highly recommend that you visit even identify what are those traits of becoming a helicopter parent or what are those triggers that may be pointing to the fact that you've become or have a proclivity of becoming a helicopter parent. <laughs> but it's not unique just to our generation, to us as the baby boomers as we are getting lambasted with this. It goes back, even back beyond 1969. It goes all the way back even to our New Testament lesson, as we see here with, with James and John's mom. And if you were to look at the Old Testament lesson that's coupled to this, and I strongly suggest that you go home and you read the story of Rebecca and her son Jacob and how she intervenes on behalf of her son. So this intervention that takes place, we recognize that it's a parental thing, it's a parental prerogative, and we're going to do that. But it needs to be governed, right, and, and exercised in a manner that is <laughs> appropriate to the development of the child. Hmm. I begin to wonder, how is it that parents think about their children? And why is it that a story even like this in the New Testament exists? You know, obviously this is a, a parental love that has been expressed for thousands and thousands of years. Now, as a dad, I can certainly empathize with feelings of wanting to assist and that kind of jazz. But for moms, I, you know, I, I can project upon that. Sure, I have a mom and I know how mom responds to me and how I, you know, receive her care, and well, now it's a little bit different. You know, she shows up about for two seconds, if I'm lucky. Um, but <clears throat> I remember back how mom was and, and what that experience is. So I thought, I'm going to ask the officers and the staff, those who are moms, just to get a clear picture of this. Now, why is it that moms feel the way they do about their children? And to try and get a sense of this, because for me to understand this passage, I thought, why? Well, I really need to get into a mom's head. Why? Because as a son, 
you know, I have a certain interpretation that comes with this experience. But I thought, I really need to understand, what is it about moms that do what they do? And so all the moms, you know, they basically said, and it's not just moms of sons, moms, they basically said, the ones I asked, they said, well, you know, Ted, here's the deal. We have this, this child that's gestating in our womb for nine months. And there's a very special connection that takes place there that actually goes beyond my ability to even explain. It's just there. You just, you just have a depth of compassion and love for this child that you can't put into words. And you will be a mama bear if something's going to threaten your child. It's just the way that it is. I went, wow, okay. So then I pushed a little further and I said, all right, moms of sons. You know, why is it that moms of sons are the way that they are? You know, that was a general, moms and daughters. And we kind of know that mom and daughter dynamic, don't we? That, that we see that. My mom and my sister, it's an interesting dynamic that exists there. Um, but, you know, moms and sons, why is it that moms are a certain way with their boys? And I asked, and, and I asked specifically, I said, moms, what is it? How is it that you view your son? Is it this way, really? And some of the moms acknowledged and said, yeah, it is that way. We view our sons very special, and we put them on a high pedestal. Sons are always considered in a very, very unique place that they can address any issue, that they can fix anything, that they have this special I don't know, aura about them that moms have for their sons. I don't know why that is, but it is there. And they couldn't even really explain the full capacity of that reality. The crazy dynamic that happens <laughs> between moms and sons, this tension that exists, and every son that's out here, I think, will acknowledge this, the crazy, crazy tension that exists is that moms, you know, they have this compassionate, nurturing quality about them that wants to gather up and protect and intervene and intercede on behalf of their sons, right? But meanwhile, the boys are like, yeah, bam, I want to bust out of this cocoon. I am a male, and I want my independence. Come on, mom. Would you just back off? How many times has a son said that to her mom? Mom, would you just back off? Would you just relax? It's going to be okay. These are the things that sons say to their moms because moms just kind of get into the mix a little too much from a boy's perspective. And so here we have this story <laughs> with James and John's moms. And it's an interesting story. You know, it's a story of, of a mom walking along, and, and it's in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, just basically in Matthew and Mark, actually. And in the Mark inversion, the mom isn't present. But Matthew certainly puts mom right there, square in the middle of the story. And so here you have mom coming up. Now, some that I talked to have said that this instance is indicative of the fact that James and John are weenies because they are having their moms do their dirty work. Now, I say, mm, mom is a helicopter mom. And the reason that James and John are weenies is because they've been weaned by their helicopter mom to be weenies. And see, that's what happens when you become a helicopter parent too much. What happens? The child no longer has the, what, the wherewithal, the confidence, or the ability. It actually backfires when you helicopter too much and intervene too much in the life of your child. It backfires in the long run. So you have these adult children who are unable to do the task that they think they need to do because the parent has intervened far too often and has created weenies. And so here comes mom and asks this question. <laughs> kind of an easy thing. Now, some scholars will say that this mom is actually Jesus' aunt. An interesting thing. 
that it's Salome, and Salome happens to be the sister to Joseph. Now, you could look at that and say, well, Ted, that makes perfect sense then. Here comes Aunt Salome up to her nephew and asking a simple question. Hey, what do you say about your cousins? Shouldn't they have uh, positions of authority when you get into power? You can look at it that way, but I choose not to because I think it's inappropriate no matter if you're an aunt or not. Because you're totally losing sight of what is the real purpose of what is happening here. Jesus is equipping his disciples to be. And it becomes a very unhealthy thing of what's happening here. And you know, the scary part is 60% of college students today have one, at least one, helicopter parent. And I begin to think about that as well, and I go, wow, what kind of impact is that going to have on our future? And specifically, even on our educators who are looking at this and saying, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. If you can give me a whole school of orphans, I'm more than happy to stay and work with children and work with students. But it's the parents who are driving me absolutely bonkers. And when we intervene too much, it creates a dynamic that the children have no idea how to take ownership of their own stuff. You know, one of the stories I read was a mom that drove three and a half hours to help her student study for a special physics exam and college, all right, for this honors course. Now, you may sit there and think, well, Ted, that's great. You know, that parent's really concerned. No, it's a college student. She should have the wherewithal to put together her own study group to get her student buddies together to study for this physics exam. <laughs> this is the problem. And, and I begin to look at this, and I think to myself, wait a minute. How does this translate in the world of our own spirituality? Because this is the real issue that's happening here with Jesus and his disciples. You know, it's one thing for us to intervene as parents and to make sure our children are safe. Let's think about this from the world of our spirituality. Because when we think about the uh, coattails that we ride on and the apron strings that we latch on to, are we coming to church because this is something that our dad did and he set the stage for us to do that? Or something that our mom did and we're just going to continue to do what mom did? And if mom happens to pass on to glory, is my spirituality still intact or do I fade out of the picture? Or how about this story, which really exists, and it's kind of a topsy-turvy, upside-down way of looking at the helicopter parent, that we're only involved in the life of the church as long as our child is involved in the life of the church. Woo-hoo. I can't tell you, and I'm sure Brian can tell you too, how many parents graduate out of church when their children are done with the youth program. This happens all the time. Because we've created this environment, right, of a helicopter spirituality. Or if you're in Sweden, they call it the curling because they sweep the way. <laughs> curling parenting. Kind of like that image. <laughs> and so are we in our own spirituality living that way? Not taking ownership of our discipleship, because that's precisely what Jesus does as he turns and looks at Salome. And in the Greek, it's not a singular second person that's being said here, but it's a second person plural as he responds to Salome's question or demand. And Jesus turns this thing on its head, and he looks her straight in the eye and looks the two disciples in their eyes and says to all three of them, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? Are you willing? You see, for us to think seriously about where we stand with Jesus in our discipleship is a very crucial question. Because where this story stands in the gospel narrative, especially all three of the, the synoptics, is that Jesus tells a story about the landowner. 
And then he tells the incident of going to Jerusalem and speaking to his disciples and saying, I am going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be handed over to be scorned, mocked, and crucified. And then he tells this incident that happens with these two disciples. And then afterwards is the healing of blind Bartimaeus. All three of the Gospels and the Synoptics tell that story exactly like that. With the exception of Luke does not have this story in it. But what is happening here and what Jesus is doing is he's connecting all of these things. Because the story of the laborers in the vineyard, what was happening here? What was happening in that story as Jesus tells the story of the landowner who invites people in to work on his fields and at the end of the day pays them? There was an attitude of entitlement and that's what was taking place. And Jesus was confronting that entitlement and that's what happens to people who are coddled and spoiled. I just got done watching the movie again for a long time. I haven't seen it since it first came out of Rain Man. And there is Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman. Both of them do a phenomenal job with their characters. And Tom Cruise's character, you absolutely hate him. Why? Because he's an entitled, spoiled brat, self-absorbed, and everything else that just makes it despicable. And at one point in the movie, he just cries out and says, I'm entitled to this. And for us... Sometimes, what is it about our own spirituality and what we think and how we come across in our expression of faith to Jesus is that we may feel like we're entitled to something. And that's what happens with helicopter spirituality or helicopter parenting. Because a child thinks it's always going to be some kind of intervention on their behalf. And there's no ownership. There's no personal ownership that I'm responsible for what I am and who I am. Not only just for my education, but for my development as a disciple. So Jesus confronts that in that story because at the end of that story it says, you know, the first will be last and the last shall be first, my friend. And then he gets to the next element and he says that reality that I have come to be flocked and mobbed and crucified. And at the end of this story that we have today, what does Jesus say? You will drink the cup. And you must first become a servant to all. For the Son of Man did not come to serve, or come to be served, but to serve and to become a ransom for all. You see how that connects? We're going from a posture of feeling like we are entitled. And Jesus is turning that on its head and deconstructing that and saying, no, friends, it's not about what you get out of this. It's about how you are to serve and how you are to embrace an attitude that says, I'm going to lay down my life as a ransom, just as Christ modeled for us. How are we laying down our lives as a ransom? Or are we riding on the coattails of our parents and holding on to the apron strings of our mom? Do we really see how our spirituality is being nurtured by a purposeful engagement with a risen Savior who has come into our lives and calls us into an encounter that says, Come, follow me. We have been talking about the priority of the gospel that says seek first the kingdom of God. Remember to place that as your highest priority. Follow him and to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. Do we really acknowledge that reality in our lives? Because Christ did not come to die on that cross so that we could get away with murder. He came and died on that cross so that we might have life and to be able to live it in a manner that shows our full gratitude for what he has done as we serve those around us and as we engage in promoting the ministry of hope and peace. Are you willing to drink the cup? That's the question. Because the cup has been poured out. 
It's poured out right here. And the invitation stands for any and all who acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. This cup has been poured out for our sake so that we might have life. And as we drink of this cup, we recognize that we are responsible for our discipleship. It doesn't rest on what great-grandpa did or what my mom does or even what my children do as they come to church. It rests on a reality that I come before the presence of a risen Savior who calls me by name.